Welcome to the LeaderCast podcast, a weekly deep dive into the stories that transformed our guests into leaders worth following. I'm your host, Joe Boyd. Today's LeaderCast podcast is with Molly Fletcher. She's been called the female Jerry Maguire. I call her my buddy, and this is a pretty great conversation. You'll learn the story that propelled her on to beat her brothers in tennis and become a college athlete. You'll learn some hacks on negotiating and what fictional blue characters she loved growing up. What's I... going on? It's good to see you. <laughs> Welcome to the LeaderCast podcast. We're so excited uh, for you to be here. You are all over LeaderCast, by the way. Uh, one of our, uh, I'm not allowed to have favorite presenters. You're one of our favorite presenters. Uh, you've spoken at several of our events and uh, been on our studio sessions on on LeaderCast now. And uh, for uh, anybody new to LeaderCast, you can jump on our website and learn a ton of stuff from Molly and a lot of really practical stuff. Uh, today, we might stumble on some of that. But really what I want to do is dive into to you and your story, what made you the leader and person you are today. Uh, so uh, we kind of use the, uh, I'm a story theory nerd, and so we just went with it. So we kind of use like Joseph Campbell's uh, Hero's Journey. So the idea is that all of this in some way or another, we started off in what was a normal world to us, felt normal. And then we get called on some adventure, usually by a mentor. And that adventure has some treasure that's waiting on the other side that when we're younger, we really think we want, but there's always these dragons and monsters that come in our way to stop us from getting that treasure. And we find a sword that the mentor gives us to slay those dragons. Usually we end up getting not what we thought we wanted, but what we actually needed. And then we bring that back to our normal world. So this podcast is about hearing that story from you and then seeing what you've got to bring us back uh, from this journey you've been on. So. Does that make sense? Is that nerdy enough for you? I love it. I mean, it's it's uh yeah, it's a little more intellectual, Joe, than I'm I'm used to coming from coming from you, my <laughs> man. But I am down for this. I'm ready to go Wait slay. Let's awesome. go slay. Let's do slay. I like it. That's a dragon pun. That's okay, right. so I, I like to start with this question. Uh take us back to young young Molly, eight, nine, 10, 11 years old. Did you go? You always went by Molly? Molly, and some people called me Molly Jean, but Molly. Mostly. Molly Jean, okay. Um, I'm curious, uh, what were the, what's the, like, um, for that age, the early, like, adventure stories that you were drawn to? Was there a TV show or a movie or a book series that you were into or anything where you're, like, uh, kind of captured your fascination or attention back then? Well, I was a tomboy, Joe, for sure. So I spent a lot of time, you know, outside trying to keep up with my two older brothers, you know, and so I was, I was climbing trees, you know, playing outside, um, riding my bike. Uh, I grew up in East Lansing, Michigan in a, in a yeah. great little neighborhood. So I, I was outside a lot. I'd say, um, you know, when I was inside and, and I played sports, you know, after school and, swam and basketball. But when I was inside, I mean, it was, you know, the family, what was it? The Brady Bunch, the Cro yeah. the Cosby <laughs> show I loved. And then I had about every kind of Smurf that ever existed. I don't know if you remember Smurfs, but I had a ton of them. Of course. Who doesn't love the Smurfs? They're very That's smart. Right. Yeah. That's <laughs> right. That's right. Well, they were fun. All those, all those examples are actually kind of uh, families or families that were kind of thrown together or little communities. So, um, yeah, yeah th that makes, that makes sense. And I know, um, often when I hear people talk about you, you get, you get, uh, when they called you on CNN, the female Jerry Maguire, right? So th yeah. that's kind of become like the, the quick introduction for you. So right. <laughs> I know, I know sports are a, a big deal in, in your life and I think you're a tennis player, but do you remember, uh, early on growing up when you first had like uh, in it, any ambition or wanting to be something or win something, was that, was that a part of your youth? You know, I, I, yes. I mean, Joe, it's, it's funny. Cause I, I was, um, you know, thinking about our, our conversation today and I, what, what comes up for me as a time, you know, I had, my parents are incredible. My brothers were five years older than me and they were identical twins, are identical twins. And, 
So one of the moments I so distinctly remember was, you know, they, they were a little bit wild. I mean, they would, you know, sketch to school and hook onto the back of cars in Michigan (laughs) in the snow in the winter. And, and, you know, and I'd sort of leave early for school and walk on the sidewalk. You know what I mean? They were crazy and fun and all these things. And most people thought they'd end up in Jackson prison, not, not (laughs) where they are now, which is airline pilots. But but I spent a lot of time trying to keep up with them. And I remember a moment when we were up in Northern Michigan where um, we would go from time to time and we decided to go play tennis at a little local park. And there was, you know, doubles as four people. And so my parents were playing with my brothers and they told me, you know, really just kind of, Hey, go, go be the ball girl. Right. Cause you, you could be the ball girl, go pick up all the balls when we're playing. And, and, um, and so I remember just begging to play and they just said, no, you're doing, you just be the ball girl, get us the ball. And here's, you know, and I was leaving that, that court that day. And I, I can still see it. And I looked at everybody and I said, you know, one of these days I'm going to beat every single one of you in tennis. <laughs> and, and my mom and dad, and my mom was so cute. She said, well, that'd be great, honey, go for it. I'd love that. That'd be awesome. And it wasn't a sarcastic, like, yeah, right. It was like, good, do it. And sure enough, like three or four years later, I beat, beat them all and they never beat me again. And, and um, so there was moments like that, yeah. that, that I remember. I can't imagine anyone telling grown up Molly Fletcher to be the ball girl. <laughs> I don't think you have to worry about it right now. Uh, so that uh, I'm wondering if that story is kind of a microcosm for like the rest of your childhood or life. Did, did you have, were there a lot of moments where you felt like you weren't getting opportunities or weren't? seen as I guess legitimate in some way because of your gender because you're a woman not not in my you know I I don't know that that moment in in my family was because I was a girl I I could have been a little boy and and they would have put me in that ball girl spot I was just the extra and I was the youngest um it certainly wasn't because of that my parents were incredibly supportive of of me equally as much as they were with my brothers but I mean, certainly as I stepped into the sports agent world, being a woman was incredibly unique. And that required a lot of moments when I was the only woman in the room. I was the only woman on the range. I was the only woman behind, you know, home plate at batting practice at big league ballparks. I mean, that happened a lot. And, and you know, you have to tell yourself the right story in those moments. And I think probably I had a lot of practice of sort of pepping, pumping myself up when I was trying to keep up at some level as a kid. Um, and I was able to transfer that when I'd find myself often as the only woman and sort of say, what are the gifts in this? How can I turn this into a positive? How can being a woman actually be a benefit? And how can I be exactly who I really am? I mean, there's no reason to try to show up like somebody else, you know, and I learned quickly that what the world wants from all of us as leaders is to be real and to be who we are. And, you know, I would be on the fence at baseball games next to guys in khakis and you know, stopwatches around their neck and chewing tobacco in their lap. And I didn't do any of that. And that was okay. And I still had a lot of success. And so I think we need to always be who we are. And, and I, um, probably some of my experiences from my youth and encouragement from my parents helped prepare me for some of those moments when I had to shift the script and find a way to find a way to deliver being different and being a woman. Yeah. When, uh, so just going back, I know you went to college, right? You played tennis in college, I believe. I did. Um, did you have the, any career ambitions around sports agency when you were in high school or going into college? Was that what you wanted to do? You know, Joe, I, I didn't know. And, and uh, you know, I really didn't know. And, and, and I was so focused on tennis in college. And, and I actually, you know, I, I thought I wanted to speak. I mean, I, I loved that. I tried out to be our high school commencement speaker. I mean, you know, I wanted to meet Zig Ziglar. I mean, all these things, but, but sports was always a part of what I loved. And, and, um, but I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what that looked like at all. I didn't know if it would be for a manufacturer, for a, you know, at a university as an athletic director, possibly I I didn't know. And I, and I always encourage, you know, we have three young daughters in college. Don't worry. It's okay. You know, just keep going, keep doing the next right thing, get in the middle of the mess and you'll learn. Yeah. I have a, my younger son's a senior in college right now. And that's been my position the whole time, but as it gets closer to the end, <laughs> I'm like, but maybe, you know, when you want them off the payroll, it's like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. I know I'll support exactly. you on anything, but pick something. 
<laughs> uh, sure. So what was, uh, well, I do wonder this, if, if uh, so uh, determined ball girl, ball girl, 10 year old, whatever you are, if, if she could time travel and see you now, I wonder what do you think she would be proud of? And is there anything she would just shake her head and be like, what's she doing? Like, who is this person? I, I think, I think she would be proud of the fact that she's the same person, just a little bit more grown up, a little bit yeah. more mature, a little bit more experiences, you know, different environment, things like that. But I think she would feel like she looks and, and behaves and acts like somebody who was really much of the red thread through, through who, who I was when I was young. Um, and, and to me, my Midwest values and, and my core values with family and, and, and friends and humility and all those things is something that, um, I would have told the older version at 10, you know, don't, don't, don't ever, don't ever lose that because that yeah. to me is what, what our role is as leaders, right? I mean, yeah. given our platform here today, I mean, that's what our role is, is to be humble, to be approachable, to put others first, to serve them every day and all day. And, and I think, you know, my parents, I'm so grateful for, taught me that through their words, but more, more so through their actions, through the way that they behaved. Um, you, you know, I, 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 uh, when I, when I was a young kid, I didn't, as a, I didn't dream about, you know, getting married and having kids and all the things that a lot of young girls dream about and think about. Um, but my favorite role in my life has been, you know, certainly being a wife, but being a mother to my daughters, uh, has exceeded every wildest dream that I could have ever imagined. And I think, you know, the 10 year old me running around probably thought I'm going to have, you know, three, three boys and be at football practice, right. <laughs> you know? And, and, uh, so I think that that would just be like, wow. And, and being, being a mother and being a wife is, is my favorite role. That's awesome. You're getting that family that you wanted early on that. Uh, That's community right. around you. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Um, okay. So let's, let's get into, uh, uh, let's get into some of the fun stuff that you get to talk about that most people don't get to talk about. Um, how in the world did you end up from being a college tennis player to uh, negotiating multi-million dollar deals for some of the most famous athletes in the world? What what happened? How did how'd that happen? Well, I mean, I, I moved to Atlanta with not a lot of money and got down to Atlanta and navigated my way into a few different opportunities. And, and long story short, after a you know, a lot of little odds and then, you know, I was a high ropes instructor. I was a receptionist. I mean, I got in with a small agency and, and had an opportunity to really start recruiting athletes and coaches. And that took a minute, but once I got in and got, got, got clear on the market and the opportunity, I began to see that there was a real opportunity there to, to go get baseball players, to get eventually college coaches, eventually PGA tour players, broadcasters, all of that. And and I, you know, I always believe, right? You got to ask for what you want. You got to be curious. You got to go for it. Um, you got to step into the discomfort, right? You've got to ask for what you want, all that. And so I sort of did all that, right? And I think, uh, again, I'm, I'm grateful for my brothers and my parents who sort of always allowed me to fail, always allowed me to get jump in the middle of the wrestling match with them and, and come out <laughs> bruised and battered, but a little bit better. And, and so, um, you know, over a period of time, I, I began recruiting and I loved that. I loved getting in front of athletes who don't trust you at all. They don't know what you really want. They're, they've got all these people that are always wanting things from them. And, and, and what I loved was getting in front of these raw relationships, building authentic connections, adding value to their lives and to their families. Mm. And, and I, you know, I always believe you sort of, you, you've got to pour into relationships before you need them. And you've got to act like you have the business before you have the business. And, <laughs> And so I poured into a lot of relationships and, and over time was able to recruit and sign players and, and, and build a, you know, a roster of almost 300 athletes, coaches, and broadcasters and, you know, men and women um, in, in a myriad of sports. And, but like a lot of our lives, right. You know, I mean, it evolved, right. It wasn't like I started and went out and signed, yeah. you know, Tom Izzo or Doc, you know, it, it happens over time and you've got to sort of start here. And I started doing 10 and 15 and 20 and, you know, $30,000 deals, and then it evolves, and there are a couple hundred thousand, and then there are a million, and then there are a couple million, and then it just, <laughs> it continues to evolve. Yeah. And, 
And the more you practice and the more comfortable you get in those environments, obviously the, the, the more confident you get and the better you get. You, uh, we've known each other for a little while now and you, you definitely strike me as a confident person. Um, some confident people I've found it, you know, maybe inside that's that you can act confident even when you're not sometimes, right. You can, um, but you, you strike me as confident and courageous. I'm curious now and recently people called imposter syndrome, but I'm, I'm just curious, did you ever have a moment, like almost an out of body moment where you're like, is what am I doing? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, did you ever have a moment of self doubt that you had to like rein it in and, and keep going or, or are you just kind of confident all the time? No, I think, oh, absolutely not. I mean, I think all of us certainly find ourselves in moments where we question, do we belong here? Can I do this? Am I yeah. good enough? And, and, and there was moments like that when I would be, you know, pitching a baseball player in a, in a meeting with a general manager or, um, you know, recruiting a player or, uh, I mean, there was, there was moments like that for sure. Um, and, 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 and I think what, what I, what I found, and I think this at some level was threaded from my, from my youth was, was it's okay to feel afraid, but, you know, courage is doing it anyway. And confidence yeah. is confidence to me. What I've found is it's built through action, right? I mean, you and I speak and, and, you know, I can, you know, that, that first keynote or two or five right. or 10, I mean, <laughs> whoo, right. What am I doing flying to San Diego? Somebody's paying me to do this, to talk to 400 people. Like what just happened? Right. right? I mean, there was moments like that, but then, um, you know, I think the more you do it, the more comfortable you get. Yeah. Where you believe it's also you weird. There. Yeah. It like lives dormant in you for me. So I, I spent my whole life performing, you know, I was sure. parking keynote speaking. It was an improv was like spent most of my life on stage and, and I'm usually fine, but I was I actually got, when we relaunched this podcast, I woke up the first morning, I was like kind of nervous. Right. <laughs> I was like, I'm just sitting in front of it. I'm literally talking to my friends for the first 20. Like I, I know these right. people, sure. um, but whenever there's just, it lives in you and then it decides to come out sometimes and just say, yeah. you know, what do you, yeah. what are you doing? <laughs> Who well, are you? and you know, and Joe, you know, the thing is, I mean, I think that it would be, um, one of the things that I learned having this front row seat to peak performance with athletes is that everybody feels that way. The best athletes feel that way. And, and it's always, I think it's so important, particularly for, for me as a female, for, for anybody that's leading or that people are listening to that we, that we're real about that, that we yeah. are afraid, that we do get scared, that we do wonder, do I belong here? That we do go, how did I even get here? That those things run through because what's important for young up and coming leaders to know is that you'll feel that way and that's okay. And they kept going. You may not know this. I've never been a professional athlete, actually. I, you know, that's amazing because you I, would, thought you played, I thought you played like in the NFL or something, man. You would think, but yeah. Um, one of the things I, because I think failures shape us more than anything else, and probably even more specifically, like coming clean with our failures, like admitting mm -hmm. them as part of our story is is kind of what mm -hmm. shapes us. And one of the mm -hmm. benefits I do think that athletes have, which is also sort of awful, is that people watch them fail in real time. Yeah. Every single time they perform. Nobody's, mm -hmm. I mean, there's what, a, one perfect game a year, I guess, but um, even then you're throwing a ball when you want to throw a strike, like you're never perfect. Um, and none of us are, but, but they, they at least get the like opportunity to deal through that. They have to deal through mm -hmm. it one way or another. Um, mm -hmm. I'm wondering with you, like, like, um, whatever you're comfortable talking about, but career wise, were there those, did you have some like failure moments where, uh, just kind of that gut punch where you're like, I just got to keep going or, and how did how did, or maybe it wasn't even a failure, but like some mm -hmm. pain that was brought on you. Um, we call that going through the cave sometimes. Did you have moments like that where you, yeah. you had to come out of it, maybe a different person? And in, in, in business or even just when I was younger or both? I think whatever comes to mind. Yeah. It's all connected, I guess. Well, I mean, right. It is. I mean, I would say one, um, what one that really bubbles up for me is, as my fall term freshman year at Michigan State, I, I was 
a preferred walk on. And so, um, you know, I was so excited about the opportunity to play at that level. And, and I, you know, got on the team and, 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 and then I, you know, pledged a sorority and I love these girls and I was having a, a lot of fun and we were, you know, and I was going to class from time to time, Joe, sure. you know, <laughs> and I will never forget. I went home to my mom and, and, uh, I said, mom, college is unbelievable. I mean, I'm playing great tennis. I mean, these girls in this house and it's so much fun. And, oh my gosh. And she goes, honey, that's great. But you can't be good at all of these things all at once. And I hope your grades aren't, aren't suffering. Sure enough, I got my grades and I got a one seven, my fall term <laughs> freshman year, which is hard to do at Michigan yeah. State, right? Like with all due respect, I mean, a one seven. And, and so that was a gut wrench of, I'd always done really well in high school and, and I'd done fine. I mean, I certainly wasn't the smartest kid in the, in, in the school, but I, I, I was definitely not somebody that was, should be getting a one seven. Right. And that was a little bit of a, whoa, you better, you better straighten up. You better act right. You better step in it. And, and then I got after I recovered pretty quick and, and I spent a lot more time in the library. There was no question about that, but that was a kind of a gut punch recover. There, there was times where I would, would go on a little bit like my senior year, I lost a bunch of matches that I should have won kind yeah. of a gut punch. And, and then I think, but, but those things, they, they strengthen our resilience, you know? So, so those things, I share those stories, not because, you know, I certainly um, know there's people listening who have had, I mean, way bigger challenges yeah. <laughs> than things like that. But I share that only as a backdrop, because to me, that resilience muscle, I felt like between older brothers, between a couple of these moments where I had to grind it, whether it was an athlete or academically, it makes you stronger. It makes you better. It makes you more resilient. And so then when I found myself in business where I was the only woman as an agent representing professional male athletes at the time that I, that I knew of, I mean, there really wasn't any other women representing big league baseball players or women representing PGA tour players. So mm -hmm. I was different. And I, I was able to sort of tap into at some level, Joe, that resilience muscle that I had built and strengthened probably at some level as a kid. Yeah. And to me, it is like a, it is like a muscle. Um, there was athletes that I went after that I didn't get. And, you know, I think you're right. You come out better. You learn from them. And, you know, I learned from those experiences. What did I do wrong? What could I have done differently? What kinds of questions could I have asked earlier? Um, all those things that we can learn, you know, when we fail or negotiations where maybe felt like I, I left something on the table or I didn't navigate it exactly right for my guy or whatever it might be. I, I think the key to all of these failures, if you will, is, 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 is really taking the time to pull back and say, what could have I, what could have I done differently? And I, and I think too, even Joe, having the courage to lean into some people that you love and trust and that you can say, Hey, how'd I do? What, what, yeah. what should I have done? You know, listening to other people who can give you feedback and support is huge. Yeah. And then you get to be a parent, right? That's right. That's yeah. the master class on, on admitting <laughs> that you didn't do it quite right. <laughs> Sorry. Talk about learning on the fly. <laughs> right. Uh, and you have twins and your brothers are twins. Is that, I should know this. Is that like a DNA thing? Is that normal? Is that? Yeah, no, you know, my brothers are identical, which is just random. It's a, yeah. it's a, you know, and my, our girls are fraternal. Okay. Um, I do think we have that uh, in our family and in, on my mom's and, and dad's side on my side. So I think that probably had a little something to do with it. Yeah. But I'm, I, I mean, Hey, I mean, it's like, I, I, I had three kids in 12 months, you know that Joe, right? So it's like, I always joke yeah. and say, I do everything fast. <laughs> we'll get, do it everything out, fast. get it, uh, <laughs> get it out of the way. That's right. Um, okay. So we're, uh, we're rounding third heading home here to just so you do, I want to use some sports analogies here. Let's go. Um, Love it. the, uh, we, we talk a lot about mentors and mentorship. Is, is, is there a single person in your life that you would point to and say, like this person really shaped my career or my, who I became uh, a big mentor in your life. And, and what would, what was the gift they gave you? Mm -hmm. You know, my greatest mentors have, have my greatest consistent mentors, I should say has been, have been my parents mm. for sure. I mean, in part because 
I mean, my mom was a speech therapist and my dad was a pharmaceutical sales rep, but you know, there was so much love and care in the work that my mom did with a lot of learning disabled kids in, a, in an inner city environment. And, and I learned a lot from her uh, watching the way she did what she did. She was very involved in our community. And then, and then my dad was a pharmaceutical sales rep. So I learned a lot about him. He has a very high EQ. And um, so they have always been people that I admire that I can go to and ask tough questions to. They'll give me real feedback. And, and now, and I think it evolves. I think your mentors can evolve. And my parents are absolutely yeah. still, but my husband is, um, but I, I really believe they're everywhere, right? I mean, we can learn from so many people in life. You know, the, the, the gentleman that I worked for for years was a mentor for me. My athletes at some level were people that, that, that in some regards were people that, that made me better. And I think at some level, that's what a mentor is. They, they make you better. They help yeah. you along. They, I mean, when I, when I stepped into that space, I, you know, when I, my first LP, my first PGA tour player, I didn't, I didn't know a lot about the PGA tour and he helped me. You know, yeah. my first couple baseball players, I didn't know a ton about the game per se, the difference between, you know, spikes and cleats and mitts and gloves and cupped and uncupped bat. I didn't know, but they helped me. They, they at some level, as odd as it might sound. And so I believe we can learn from, you know, I heard a story the other day about a, about a guy that bagged groceries at, at a grocery store and everybody kept getting clogged up in his line where he was bagging groceries and the manager mm -hmm. couldn't figure out why the heck everybody was in this one line when all the other lanes were open and this young kid would leave motivational quotes every day in these different bags as people would wow. check out and leave. And, you know, he was, I don't, you know, young kid and he's a mentor, right? I mean, and so they're everywhere if we stay curious and we keep yeah. our hearts and minds open. That's really great. I remember spending the most of my twenties, I, I journaled a lot in my twenties. I should, I should do it more now. I got out of the habit, but I would, when I look back like three times a week, I'm asking for a mentor. I'm like, I'm, I'm wanting this, what was in my mind, this one like old sage with a beard mm -hmm. and like a pipe or something, I don't know, like Gandalf yeah. to wander yeah. in yeah. and just yeah. give me. And then as I look back on it, I had them, they just, yeah. it wasn't all in one person. Right. But I, I was blessed with all these relationships uh, just back then I wanted it to be like one easy phone call <laughs> yeah. with one person, <laughs> one uh, bat that, line to one right. genius. That would be nice. Yeah. That's the way it is in the movies, but they have to condense to get the script to work. That's, 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 that's <laughs> it's not real. Reason. It's yeah. not real. Come on. Uh, well, I know, uh, you spent the better part of the last decade or so as a, a author and a speaker. Um, and, uh, like I said, uh, Leadercast folks are familiar with you for sure, but new people hopefully finding this podcast. Uh, where can they go to to find out more about what you're doing now? Yeah, you know my podcast, Game Changers with Molly Fletcher, is a is a we've been so blessed to have some incredible guests. And, but but my website, MollyFletcher.com, is a great place for folks to go and check out for sure. Yeah, cool. Okay, try to end with one serious question and one ridiculous question. I so we'll start it. with the serious one. Uh, negotiating, I assume is something you had to do, right? And I know yeah. you, you've written about it some. We all do it every day, I guess. It's very intimidating to folks that don't see themselves as negotiators. So what, what's your like, maybe two or three like negotiating hacks? If you know, if you're whether you're buying a used car or you're, <laughs> you're dealing with uh, someone you really want to hire that's asking for more, more money than you have or whatever it is, uh, yeah. what, what's your best stuff? You know, get into their world. I think one of the biggest mistakes we make when we negotiate is we spend so much time thinking about what we want and not enough time thinking about what matters most to them. We got to get into their world. What are they worried about? What are they excited about? What are, What's draining them every day? What, what what problem can you at the core help solve for them? And But we've got to get in their world. And, I, you know, I, I have a couple of funny stories about that because to me, it, there is also, you know, opportunities to negotiate all the time in life, everywhere we turn. And I think the other hack to, you know, the other thing I would encourage people to do is practice, do it, do it everywhere, right? Go get your latte tomorrow at Starbucks and kind of work the barista and get a free shot of espresso. I mean, just have fun with it. 
Go yeah, find yeah. a dress at the store and it's got a little mark on it and go get 25%. I mean, just practice, right? Just keep, just practice and have fun with it. And, and the, because what happens with negotiation, the more you do it, the more you practice, the better you get, the more you see what works. You know, hacks are, you know, when we're starting to get defensive, potentially inside of a serious, big negotiation, yes. get curious, start asking questions, just get curious, just continue mm -hmm. to get curious. And that to me unlocks an opportunity to get more in their world, more in their head and heart. The other hack I'd say, Joe, for sure is pause. You know, if, if you're negotiating effectively, you're building good relationships, you, you know, you're, you're engaging, you're connected, you've maybe set the stage a little bit. Now, when you ask for what you want, just stop. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest mistakes people make is they, you, you know, they go up to the barista and, and they've been nice mm -hmm. to her a little bit along the way. And then she makes there or he, you know, and then, and then the biggest mistake they make is like, Hey, do you think I could get a shot? Because you know, my car and I've got this, da, 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 stop, just get, Hey, what about, you know, what do you, what do you think? How about an extra and smile and shut up. Yeah, the biggest just, mistake is people just keep talking. So that's a big one to me too. The pause after you ask. Is a huge secret weapon. Love it. That's very helpful. I will. Uh, there's a Starbucks right around the corner. I'll go, go try it right after this. And then you um, know, and then what I say, Joe, you know, then go around the corner and put put a buck in the tip jar. But yeah, yeah. Then everybody wins except the Starbucks Starbucks shareholders. They'll be okay. Uh, um. So uh. Okay. So here's my question. I'm trying to formalize my question. So, uh, you get to pick three athletes living or dead to take them to lunch in Michigan. <laughs> no. So I want to know who are the three athletes and where are you going for lunch? Oh, this is so cool. Do I have to take them all at the same time or can I have three separate lunches? No, it's all at the same time. Oh man. Okay. I would go with, um, I would go with Serena Williams for sure. I would go with Kobe and I would go with Federer. All right. I like that. I'm excited. So are you going to make that happen? And where would I go? I would go to, um, where would I go? I would go to Dusty's. And right. where's that? <laughs> it's just, it's, just, it's a, it's the, I think it's probably the nicest restaurant in Lansing. Um, no, I would go to Dusty's or I would actually probably go to a, um, a cool little fun spot in Northern Michigan. Yeah. I'm kind of envisioning this, Joe. I mean, I got, well, let's make it happen. Well, Kobe, I mean, Kobe can't, we could get a coach. She will do Shaq instead of Kobe. Yeah. Uh, it's not, a fair know, that's my shot. Yeah. I'd, yeah. I'd but no, but, but, but Hey, I mean, Co we could bring Kobe there in spirit and then we would have <laughs> Federer and Serena, I can't even get my head around that experience. I'd be out of hand. I'd have you mad. had uh, either of them on your podcast? I have not yet. I was waiting for you to set that up for me. That's right. yeah, I'll, I'll text Serena. I'll, when I'm done here. Thank you. Yeah. That'd be great. That was awesome. You're the best. We love you so much. Thank you so much for being a part of this, opening up with your whole story. Uh, it was awesome. Thank you, Molly. Did we slay? Did we slay the dragon? We slayed it. We killed it. Just like, yeah. the, just like Gargamel. <laughs> We, the, awesome. Smurfs, the Smurfs came in. Adriel said <laughs> cat. I know, I know some Smurf having. stuff. That's Bye, right. Molly. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Joe. You're awesome. <laughs>